welcome back to the final session today. So, we are into the discussion mode. First, let me go to 1193 Ram Mege Institute, Badnera. Over to you. Yes. At triple point 3 phases coexist in equilibrium. So, my question is. Suppose uh, we have 10 kg of substance uh, in an adiabatic container, uh, there is 5 kg of ice, 3 kg of water and 2 kg of steam. After some time, will there be any changes in masses of uh, all the three phases? Uh, yes, uh, consider a simpler version of your question. <coughs> Suppose you have an adiabatic container. Now, remember adiabatic means no heat transfer, nothing more, nothing less than that. Okay. And suppose you have uh, just steam and water in it or even ice and water in it. Say ice and water and uh, they are at some temperature, say 0 degree C appropriate, uh, 0 degree C you will not have, uh, say um, point 0 0.01 degree C, just ice and water, no steam. Depending on the work being done or energy interaction of some kind, it is possible that the pressure remains the same, temperature remains the same, but the state changes because some water changes to ice and the ice changes to water. Your query regarding triple point is more interesting because at the same pressure and temperature, you will have all the three phases together. So, that means without changing pressure, without changing pressure, you can have interactions. What will happen is the relative masses of solid, liquid and vapor will change. So, the volume will change, energy will change, entropy will change, enthalpy will change. Okay. In case of a water steam mixture, we define the dryness fraction. There is only one fraction we need to define because the other fraction turns out to be 1 minus dryness fraction. So, the liquid fraction is 1 minus x, vapor fraction or dryness fraction is x. When you have a triple point situation, you will have to have three fractions. The solid fraction x s, a liquid fraction x l and a vapor fraction x v. The sum of these three will be 1. So, two of them can vary independently. Over to you. Thank you, sir. Uh, my next question is, in example 2.18, 2 uh, the process is modeled as P V is equal to constant. Uh, the process may be modeled. That means, the process is executed along a line on the P V diagram which says P V equals constant. Yes. Is it isothermal process? Look, read the problem completely. If it is 2.18, we have some amount of steam. Now, steam is not an ideal gas. Okay. So, a steam may execute a process or can be made to execute a process which is PV equals constant, but it does not mean it is an isothermal process. It only means that it is a quasi static process such that at any stage if you measure pressure, measure volume multiply them together for all intermediate states you will get a constant volume constant value that is it and that is why you are given that the initial state is 2 bar dry saturated so the temperature will be something like 120.2 or whatever is dictated by the steam tables 2 bar dry saturated let me see 120.2 degree c okay then it it is taken to 8 bar final state 2. So, the pressure goes up by a factor of 4. So, the volume would have decreased by a factor of 4. So, the initial volume will be the specific volume at 2 bar liquid sorry 2 bar dry saturated right that is 0.886 meter cube per kilogram multiplied by 1.5 kg that will be the initial volume. The final volume will turn out to be one fourth of that because the pressure has gone up by four times, volume will reduce by four times. So, divide that by four and you will get the final volume. Since you know the final pressure and final volume, you know the final state and depending on the final state, you can determine the temperature, you can determine the energy, initial, final. 
the PV raised to constant will be useful when you consider work done by steam, because work done by steam will be the area under the curve which can be determined using that PV equal to constant line. And then you will have to use first law to determine the heat absorbed by steam. Maybe I should explain it on this. So, can you show the whiteboard please? So, this is the query regarding F 2.16, sorry 2.18. You have compression. So, a cylinder piston arrangement is in order, some pressure P. One point five kg steam. Initial state two bar dry saturated. Final state eight bar. It's compressed. Anything else given? Process may be modelled as PV equals constant. So, naturally this implies that it is a quasi static process. Now, process diagram. Since we are going only between 2 and 8 bar, it is not necessary for me to show the whole two phase dome. You can This is pressure in bar and let us have this as, let us work with specific volume, everything will get scaled up by 1.5 because the mass is 1.5. 2 bar to 8 bar, 2 bar dry saturated. So, this is our state 1. Okay. The process executed is P v raise to, sorry P v raise to 1 or P into v is constant. So, let us assume that the P V raise to this is P into V is constant. Okay, so, this is the process. Naturally, state 2 will be at 8 bar and the line dictated by P V equals constant. So, this will be 2. Okay. And area under this curve when multiplied by the mass of the system assuming the scale goes down up to 0. This is the expansion word. Okay. So, now final temperature and final state. The final state will be given by, it is given by two conditions. First, P 2 is 8 bar given and it is also given that P 2 V 2 is P 1 V 1. Okay. Hence, we can calculate or dividing throughout by uh, mass, we get P 2 V 2 is P 1 V 1. So, this gives us V 2 equals V 1 into P 1 by P 2. And if you put V 1, which is uh, dry saturated vapor at 2 bar, this is 0 0.886 meter cube per kg multiplied by 2 by 8 bar over bar. So, this will turn out to be one fourth of this that is 0 0.2215. Okay, meter cube per kg. So, V 2 this and P 2 this is the final state. These two items together P and V. Remember P and V will always give us a final state because it is not a combination P T. If it is P T then we have to be careful. Okay. Now, notice that at 8 bar, look up the table page 8. 
in, um, in my case it is page 8, if you are using a different table it will be something different. Okay. Now this is at 8 bar we have V f equals 0 0.001115 meter cube per kg, V g is 0 0.240 meter cube per kg. Since V f is less than V 2, of course this is you should I would write V f 2 and V g 2. Since V f 2 is less than V 2, less than V g 2, hence or I should say since therefore state 2 is wet steam. And since it is wet steam, now you can calculate x 2 is V 2 minus V g sorry V f 2 divided by V g 2 minus V f 2. This gives you the value of x 2. And from now P 2 V 2 has given us x 2 and now P 2 x 2 will allow us to calculate u 2, t 2. Since it is wet steam, the final temperature is the saturation temperature 170.4. The initial temperature we did not calculate, but since it is P 2 is 2 bar and it is saturated, uh, uh, sorry P 1 is 2 bar and since it is given x equal to 1, this implies that T 1 is 120.2 degrees C. And it is obvious to you now that because it is steam, P V equals constant does not represent an isothermal process. So, the initial temperature is 120.2 degrees C, the final temperature is 170.4 degrees C. There is a very significant temperature difference. So, now with this we are able to determine final temperature, final state. Now, change in energy delta E, first you will have to assume to be equal to delta U, assume because there is no other component of energy mentioned. So, this now becomes M into U 2 minus U 1 and U 1 can be read off, U 2 can be calculated from here. M is given, U 2 is calculated, U 1 can be read off from the initial state. And now we have to determine W, work done by steam. First you have to write W is W expansion, this is assumed because there is no mention of, mention of a stirrer or any electrical work. Since it is a quasi static process, this will be integral 1 to 2 of P d V quasi static, so we can evaluate it. This will be true anyway, but we can evaluate it because it is quasi static. And because the process is P 1, V 1 is P V is constant. So, P can be replaced by P 1, V 1 divided by no, sorry, P can be replaced by P 1, V 1 divided by V. P 1, V 1 can be taken out of the integral sign. So, it will be logarithm of V 2 by V 1. We know P 1, we know V 1 that is M into the specific volume at 1 and uh, V 2 by V 1 is known as P 1 by P 2 which is 4. So, this can be calculated and after this is calculated heat absorbed by steam. Mind you notice that this will be a negative number because V 2 is smaller than V 1 and then Q should always be calculated as delta E plus W, no other choice. We have determined delta E, we have determined W, so you can determine Q. This is the procedure. Over. Yes, sir. Uh, what is supercritical fluid? Okay. Supercritical fluid is the name given to the state of a fluid where the temperature is higher than the critical temperature.
but generally we can there is no proper definition generally we can say uh, any state in which either the pressure or the temperature is higher than their corresponding critical values we can say it is a supercritical fluid. 1056 Malla Reddy College of Engineering and Technology, Sikandrabad. My question is triple point is assumption and postulate. So, how do we how do we plot in this P V diagram as in real platform? No, what is your question? It is regarding triple point, but I did not understand what you said after that. I will repeat sir, uh, triple point is assumptions or postulate. No, triple point, wait, 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 I will stop you there. Triple point is not assumed, the triple point is not postulated, triple point exists and you can have a simple uh, apparatus which you can create using a good glass blower, a vacuum pump and a freezing unit and pure water the so called conductivity water or as pure water and you can create the triple point apparatus in your lab and measure the triple point. If you go on to uh, the uh, on Google or YouTube and say triple point of water, you will get enough information including excellent videos of how a triple point apparatus is created and triple point uh, temperature is noted. I should not say measured because triple point temperature is only to be noted, it is defined. Okay, over to you. 1012. My question is related to charging of cylinder while charging the evacuated cylinder by external gas line which is having sufficiently high temperature when the charging process completes. That means the temperature of the pipeline is equal to the temperature of the cylinder. The gas inside the uh, cylinder is having a, a temperature significantly higher than that of the main, ga main gas pipeline. I want to know the reason for this. The reason, the, actually it is interesting you are all jumping the gun. This is a problem pertaining to open systems and we will tackle it at that time, but I will bring your attention. Uh, to exercise, uh, where I have that exercise somewhere here. In open thermodynamic system, there is a exercise OS14 on page 15. This is very similar to what you are saying and it will be clear to you why the temperature rises. It is a very simplified version of what you say, an evacuated bottle is filled by allowing air to fill in. Okay. When we come to open system studies, we will come to that problem and then you can solve many other problems like this. Okay. The next visit is 1107. Yes sir, please explain the rudimentary system and uh, one way work transfer. Okay. Uh, first thing we appreciate that some one depending on the type of system, some work modes are one way, some work modes are two way. Simple illustration is if you stir a liquid, you are, uh, if you take a fluid and stir it, that is a one way work mode because by stirring you can do work on the fluid. If the fluid is initially in equilibrium, and you put in a stirrer or a spoon, ask the liquid to stir it, the liquid will not do it. That is a one way mode of heat transfer. Whereas, a fluid in a cylinder piston arrangement, if you reduce the pressure on the piston, external pressure on the piston slightly, that will expand. If you increase the external piston on the piston slightly, it will compress. So, a expansion compression process is a two way work mode. Okay. Now, if you have appreciated this, then you will also be able to appreciate that there are systems which have more than one two way work mode possible. An electrolyte for example, can expand and contract and can also be charged and discharged. So, electro, electrolytes, electromagnetic substances, the fluids used in magnetohydrodynamics, these are all complex systems. 
because they have more than one work mode. You have uh, compression expansion work possible, you have electrical work possible, perhaps you have magnetic work possible, right. Now, going to the other extreme, it is possible to have systems which are inherently incapable of doing any two way mode of work or we can create systems by constraining them in such a way that the no two way work mode is possible. For example, we have seen that a gas in a cylinder piston arrangement becomes a uh, is a simple compressible system and it has one two way work mode that of expansion and compression. But if I fix the piston at one place, seal it with araldite or M seal, then whatever be the change in external pressure, the gas will not get compressed or gas will not try to expand. So, this way that becomes a system in which there is no two way work mode possible and hence it becomes a rudimentary system. There are simpler systems which are basically rudimentary for example, your mercury in glass thermometer. You can say solid is to some extent compressible, but in the range of temperature and pressures which we use the mercury in glass thermometer or the clinical thermometer is a rudimentary system because there is no two way work mode possible. You cannot bend or unbend it, you cannot twist or untwist it, you cannot charge or discharge it, you cannot expand or compress it and hence it is a rudimentary system and hence that single the advantage of a rudimentary system is the state is defined by a single property and we can directly map that property to define a scale of temperature or we can define a scale of temperature using that single property. We do not have to worry about what happens to other properties when it interacts thermally with other systems. Over to you. Can you get out of this demo mode? Huh. So, F 2.17, huh. what is the problem? How to solve it? How we will move in this problem? How to how we will move? Uh, we have find out the volume, total volume. Look, if you read it, we have a rigid insulated vessel. Rigid means no change in volume, expansion work is 0. Insulated vessel means adiabatic situation, any heat interaction will be 0. Then it is divided into two chambers by an adiabatic partition wall. One chamber contains 1 kg of wet steam at 4 bar and some dryness fraction. Other chamber contains 0.5 kg of dry saturated steam at 2 bar. If the partition between the chambers is removed and the fluids on both sides allowed to mix, determine the specific volume, specific internal energy, pressure and dryness fraction in the final state. Okay. The situation is this F 2.17. We have a rigid insulated vessel, I will just show it by a dotted line, a partition. Our system is the total internal of this rigid insulated vessel. So, rigid means delta V is 0 this implies W expansion is 0. Insulated means Q is 0. Now, let us say this is the A part, this is the B part. The initial state 1 consists of one part A is 1 kg 4 bar Dryness fraction 0.7. So, using this we can determine all properties. In the final state the partition is removed and everything is allowed to mix. 
after mixing you get a of course, there is I forgot there is a B part M B is 0.5 kg P B is 2 bar X B is 1. From here we can again determine all properties. Now, final state 2, what do we know about the final state? First thing because it is rigid, we can say V 2 equals V 1. And since V 1 is going to be made up of two parts, V 1 is going to be V A plus V B. And this will be because M A and M, M A V A plus M B V B. V A and V B you would have calculated from the states. This is one property of the thing. Second property is mass of 2 is going to be mass of 1 which is M A plus M B. We know both of them sorry I am using lower case M for mass. So, let me continue using that. So, the final M 2 is going to be M 1 because it is a rigid vessel nothing is coming in nothing is going out which will be M A plus M B which will be 1 plus 0.5 kg 1.5 kg. So, I know the final volume I know the final mass so the I know the final specific volume that is one aspect of state 2. The second aspect of state 2 is I do not know what the pressure is, I do not know what the temperature is, but the first law includes energy. So, let us see whether I can use the first law to get a fix on the energy of the system. The first law says Q equals delta E plus W. Note that you always start from this equation. Q is given to be 0. For delta E, we will assume delta E is delta U because there is no mention of any movement or any other aspect. W, we will assume that this is equal to W expansion because there is no indication of a stirrer or electrical work. And since the volume is rigid, this turns out to be 0 as we have already noted here. And that gives me delta u is 0 and that means m into u 2 minus u 1 is 0 and that means u 2 equals u 1 or even without going through this perhaps it is better to write this as u 2 equals u 1 which is m a u a plus m b u b and all in all information about initial states is known. So, u 1 is known. So, u 2 is known and then you get u 2 is u 2 by m 2. So, state 2 gets defined in terms of v 2, u 2 and of course, m 2, but it is v 2 and u 2 which will give you the final fix up to V t, V 2 and U 2 you can come straight away volume specific internal energy. When it comes to pressure and dryness fraction this V 2 and U 2 is an odd thing to look at. If you look at their values you would perhaps get a hint from your steam tables that the pressure is going to be somewhere between 2 bar and 4 bar in that range and it is going to be wet steam. And hence what you will have to do is by trial and error determine P 2 and X 2 by trial and error. Okay. And you proceed like this assume some P 2 which may not be right. Okay. Using P 2 and V 2 
but not using uh, u2 you calculate one dryness fraction let me call it x2 prime using the sum same value of p2 use p2 and u2 using these two you can calculate another value of x2 prime okay if x2 prime equals x2 double prime or is within a very small fraction like 3 zeros 1 remember our typical xs are calculated as four decimal places so if it is the very uh, difference is only in the fourth place it's okay then p2 is the final pressure otherwise try a different guess of p2 that's the process okay. or what you can do is do the following guess values various values of p and plot the dryness fraction calculated by the two methods maybe if you select different values of p it's possible that x2 prime this is p2 x2 prime goes like this whereas x2 double prime goes like this at some place the two graphs will intersect then this is the value of final x2 and this is the value of final p2 you can determine for a few sets of points then draw smooth curves through them and wherever they intersect you have a solution i hope this satisfies you over to you i am now attempting 1 1 2 2 Uh, sir as we can analyze the temperature pressure work uh, in a practical manner sir can we understand the term enthalpy in practical way sir or enthalpy is just a mathematical form of internal energy and work done or is there any physical significance of this term enthalpy because in good old books on heat and power and engines including perhaps d a lo and rangham and such enthalpy is mentioned as the total forget that enthalpy has no significance except that it is a short form for u plus pv and don't even bring into picture the idea that pv represents work or flow work of any kind pv here represents only pressure volume product okay it may come out of our Uh, first law of thermodynamics for open systems that pv i know comes out of the flow work term but h when it is defined it is defined only as a short form of u plus pv there is no physical significance for h we use it because that form u plus pv comes up so often that we find it convenient to create a short form for it that's it over to you so one more question sir as we have already discussed that work is a path function so it follows the inexact differential sir is the inexact differential has any significance or it is just a mathematical term that uh, if it follow the equation mdx plus ndy equal to constant zero or constant then Yes you are right we will come to this exact and inexact differentials tomorrow when we do property relations but an exact differential is exactly what you said that exact differential is one which when integrated from point 1 to point 2 in a coordinate system the integration turns out to be independent of the path an exact differential can be shown as the differential of some complicated function of x y z 
whereas an inexact differential cannot be shown so. Of course, there are theories of then integrating factors and all that, but we do not have to bring them in just now. The basic difference between exact and inexact differentials, uh, if we understand it, that is good enough for us. Hello, sir, one more question. Yes. Uh, can all process in thermal energy reservoir can be considered as quasi static or not? Okay, see. Uh, we are interested only in two aspects of a thermal reservoir. Number one, its temperature, which is always maintained constant. Number two, later on we may need to estimate or determine the entropy difference or entropy change of a reservoir. Okay. That we will determine as the heat absorbed by the reservoir divided by the temperature divided by its temperature okay. and because of that we do not really have to worry about whether all processes inside a thermal reservoir are quasi static or not. Okay. That, that question just does not need to be answered over. Thank you sir. Sir one more question can we use same plant as heat pump in winter and as a refrigerator in summer? Uh, from a thermodynamic point of view, yes, but in an actual practice what happens is in the summer the plant will work between an outside temperature of say 45 degrees C and inner temperature of say 25 degrees C. So, the range of operation is between 25 and 45. In winter, you may have the inner temperature or the higher temperature as 25 degrees C outer temperature as say 0 degrees C. So, the range of temperatures in which that uh, heat pump operates is different. So, you will have to worry whether the oils will do their job properly, whether the working fluid will have the appropriate characteristic. Remember that uh, our air conditioner, we have modern air conditioners, but uh, the old window air conditioners, they used R22 as the refrigerant. Why? Because they worked in outside temperature of about 40, 45, inner temperature of about uh, 20, 25, right. Refrigerators, the ones which we have in our house and which are used to make ice and keep cool things chilled, they work with ambient temperatures of about say 35, 40, maybe 45 degrees C. But they work inner with inner temperatures of 0, minus 5, minus 10 degrees C. See the range is slightly wider, but we suddenly replace R22 by R12 and now with R134A or something like that. Okay. So, the properties of the fluids required and hence the surrounding materials which are required, they change sometimes significantly even with small changes in temperature. So, yes thermodynamically in principle you can use, but the same thing whether for example, uh, you are in Udaipur, maybe the winters are cold, summers are hot. So, maybe your question is in summer I have a air conditioner, can I turn it around and use it as a uh, uh, heater in winter? My only question is try and see what happens. It will work, but whether it will be good for the health of that and whether it will be a very effective and efficient heat pump, uh, you have to turn it around and see. Over to you. 1277 Technology Education and Research Integrated Institutions Kurukshetra. Over to you. Uh, as we take a boiler, and uh, can you tell me what type of uh, interaction is there, and what type of system if we take, if we are only interested in the heat transfer from the hot gases to and in the water? So what is the question about? I want to, you want to consider what? What type of system is that if we are only interested in the heat transfer from the hot gases and in the water? What type of system is there? You are, boiler, the both sides are open thermodynamic systems, hot gas on one side and the steam being generated on the other side. 
it was rudimentary or we can say it was a simple or complex no 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 which you are considering a boiler right what is the system that you are considering boiler a simple boiler simple boiler in which water flows and becomes steam and in through which you uh, put fuel and air and hot gases come out of the other side that type of boiler ha ah, yeah okay then it's an open system there is no question of it being rudimentary open system means you have perhaps expansion work we have uh, flow work which is some sort of expansion work you have a pump which is absorbing some type of work it, there is no question rudimentary system etc are specific to closed thermodynamic system sir there is the same question i have i have the doubt if it's a closed boiler in which there uh, the water is on the upper side and the fire, we are firing the boiler from the bottom side and we are collecting the steam on the upper side of the water space that is the steam space then what type of work interaction is there in that there is only flow work as the steam goes out if you say that the vessel is rigid there will not be any expansion work if there is no stirrer or pump there will not be any um, electrical or stirrer work the only work interaction will be the expansion work and of course heat transfer but that's not a work interaction heat transfer from the hot gases to the boiler boiling water when we come to open systems we will have enough number of such problems let's just now discuss closed systems but in case of thermometer it's also a closed system in which we apply heat to the bulb thermometer bulb and the mercury inside the bulb it got expanded and we call it a rudimentary system see remember that there is also one way of interaction no when i say a mercury in glass thermometer is a rudimentary system my system includes everything my system boundary is the outer boundary of the glass casing if you are looking at just the mercury which is expanding then that's not a thermometer that's a system you can say it's a cylinder piston arrangement with mercury in it which is expanding but if i create a capillary in which on one side you have mercury and above that you have vacuum and the capillary is sealed in a glass envelope and my system is whatever is included in that glass outer surface of the glass then it is a rudimentary system the moment you change the boundaries of a system you are defining a new system and the new system may not have all the characteristics of the earlier system one has to be that is why i am emphasizing that location of the boundary is very important even a slight change in the boundary changes the situation sometimes very significantly over to you it's a closed boundary and the mercury is inside that yeah. yes but agree but your close boundary is different from my close boundary which is the outer surface of the glass envelope and when i define a thermometer and claim that it's a rudimentary system i have defined my system to be the one inside the outer surface of that glass envelope when you say mercury and it's in a close boundary but that's a different boundary you are talking of a different system that system may not be a rudimentary system sir there is one more question also yes at low pressure and if we keep the temperature constant the uh, the water will start boils at low suppose pressure. the temperature is for 50 at low pressure hmm. sir generally we calculate that if the pressure is one atmospheric and the temperature is 100 degree centigrade hmm. the water start boiling hmm. but if we take the pressure low and keeping the temperature constant still then the uh, the amount of uh, we can collect the amount of papers why don't we apply that formula in boiler no you are looking at a different process now here you are looking at a process where you are keeping the temperature the same let's again go to the pressure temperature diagram and let's start from the triple point and go to the critical point let us say this is the pressure which is 1 bar 
this will be something like 99 point or this is let me say 1 atmosphere. So, this is say 100 degree C okay. and if you have water at this temperature, it will not boil because the pressure is above its saturation pressure. But if you reduce the pressure, then you are changing the state of the system like this, you are going along this line. So, if you go on reducing the pressure, you will first read, reach a saturated liquid point at that temperature, then it will start evaporating and then for all you know, if you start continuing your process further, it will even become superheated steam at low pressure. This is possible to do. Over to you. PhD College, Coimbatore, 1136. Over to you. Sir, what is the significance of the supercritical fluid, sir? Because we are, now we are uh, in the industries, we are using supercritical boilers in nuclear power plants. So, what is the uh, quant qualitative significance of that supercritical uh, uh, fluid, sir? Uh, first, a correction. I do not know of any nuclear power plant which uses supercritical steam. But fossil fuel fired that is coal fired or gas fired power plants do use supercritical steams. Uh, when it comes to power plant, the temperatures even in old power plants have been supercritical that is above 373 degrees C. A steam power plant is claimed to be a supercritical power plant only when the pressure is supercritical, not the temperature. Temperatures of 500, 550, nearly 600 degrees C have been used for the last 20, 30 years. But the pressures above 220 bar, those are rare. We have started using them only recently. Okay. And there is nothing special about supercritical boilers. Uh, tomorrow we will realize that if you have a power plant, the efficiency of the power plant tends to be higher if the uh, upper temperature at which heat is absorbed increases and hence increasing the temperature with a fluid like water will naturally lead to super higher temperatures and correspondingly higher pressures. So, we end up being uh, in the realm of supercritical steam power plants. Otherwise, there is nothing, there is nothing special about being supercritical. If we go to high enough pressures and high enough temperatures to gain efficiency, we automatically end up in the supercritical zone of water. That is it. Over. Sir, my next question, sir. Sir, in the Gibbs phase rule, sir, if, uh, in, the, in the degrees of freedom, so if it is coming as F is equal to 2, is there any thumb rule to select the properties? Either I can go for pressure temperature or pressure volume. So, just it is coming as F is equal to 2. Yes. Sir, is there any thumb rule to select the properties? Uh, there is no thumb rule to select the properties. When F equals 2, you are essentially free to select any two properties you feel like. They could even be pressure and temperature. Okay. Uh, well, I am not an expert in phase rule, but I recommend you a book by Findlay, F I N D L A Y. The title of the book is The Phase Rule. You will find everything about the phase rule right from its basic derivation in that book. You will find more details discussed in that book. It is a classic, you should find it in your library. Maybe it is in the physical chemistry or uh, chemical thermodynamics section. Over. 1167 BVM Anand. Now, I have, uh, uh, I have one suggestion that the, at the end of each exercise, you may give some answer. So, that whenever we solve it, we can have, we can, we can have the confidence of the answer. Well, your suggestion in welcome. In fact, till a few years ago, I used to do that and if I take a printout of, of course, this got modified, but 
I used to have answers at the end of the exercises, particularly those which require an, or which end up in a numerical answer. But then I found out that the students are interested only in getting that answer and not following the procedure. So, after that I decided that answers are meaningless. In fact, recently I have started setting up problems in which students have to explain in detail how that uh, answer is obtained without obtaining the answer itself. I will, uh, maybe there are a few problems here, I will bring them to your attention later. Go ahead. Another question, in, uh, in question F 2.12, there is a mixing of two stream. How to find out the work done in this case? Okay. Uh, 2 kg of saturated liquid water at 12 bar is mixed with 1 kg of superheated steam at 12 bar 300 C. Mixing is adiabatic and at constant pressure. I hope you do not take any objection to that, adiabatic and at constant pressure. Determine the changes in volume and internal energy, the dryness fraction in the final state and work done. Okay. Here you proceed like this. This is this is a problem which can be solved either by modeling it as a closed system or by modeling it as an open system. The final answer will turn out to be the same. Okay. So, what we have is we have a chamber it is a constant pressure process. So, we can have a cylinder piston arrangement. And we can say that initially the system is partitioned into two parts, part A and part B. So, the initial state, state 1 is made up of A plus B, where A is 2 kg, 12 bar pressure, saturated liquid that is x is 0. And the B part is 1 kg, again 12 bar, uh, three hundred degrees C. So, properties of A and properties of B are all determinable. So, the, all the properties of the initial state are known. Note in particular that the pressure of each part is 12 bar and hence the external pressure should also be 12 bar to keep it in equilibrium. The, we can now assume that the mixing takes place by say assuming that the partition is removed and let the final state of the complete system be 2. Now, on the P V diagram, you are going to have the whole process taking place at some constant pressure. Since the initial pressure is 12 bar, we expect the final pressure to be also 12 bar and since it, it said that at constant pressure, we expect the whole process to take place on this 12 bar line. Now, what is going to happen is our initial state 1, now notice that this is uh, the total volume in meter cube and not specific volume. If you write sketch in terms of specific volumes, this is P and specific volume. If this is the 12 bar line. The A part is going to be saturated liquid at 12 bar. The B part is going to be superheated steam at 12 bar, 300 degrees C. They are going to mix and maybe this part will move something like this, this part will move something like this and we will end up with a final state somewhere on this line. But this line gives a not really a correct picture because A and B do not individually move, they mix together and then if this is our state 1, the final state may be to the left of it, to the right of it that will tell us, but finally it goes to somewhere here or somewhere here. The state 2 may be here or the state 2 may be here. Okay. And wherever it goes, this 
will be suppose it goes from 1 to 2 like this, this will be the amount of expansion work done. If it goes like this, this will be the amount of expansion work done. Okay. This is the visual depiction, 2 will be somewhere here, but you understand that A and B do not individually come to 2, they mix and the final mixture mixed system goes from 1 to 2. Of course, here writing one like this also is not very correct because it is made up of two sub parts with same pressure, but two distinct states otherwise. Now, let us analyze it and see what is the set of assumptions that we have to make. It is a closed system. So, the first law will simply be Q equals delta E plus W. Q is given to be 0, given adiabatic. Delta E, let us assume it to be delta U, when there is nothing else mentioned. There is no stirrer etcetera mentioned, so let us assume this is W equals W expansion, all, also assumed. So, that means the first law ends up being delta U plus W expansion is 0. Now, let us make an assumption that the process is quasi static, because it is mentioned that it takes place at constant pressure. And hence, W expansion which is integral P d V will turn out to be from here to here, we have the assumptions quasi static and P constant. And again using P constant, we write this as delta U plus delta P V is 0 and that gives us, because enthalpy is defined is delta H is 0. This means H 2 equals H 1 and H 2 will then be M 2 H 2 equal to H 1 is made up of two parts M A H A plus M B H B. We know everything on the right hand side, on the left hand side M 2 by so called conservation of mass will turn out to be M A plus M B. So, in this equation we know everything except H 2 which can now be calculated. Since we know P 2, P 2 and H 2 give us the final state. Compare H 2 with the saturated liquid enthalpy and dry saturated vapor enthalpy. If it lies in between, it is wet steam. If it lies uh, higher than dry saturated vapor enthalpy, it is superheated vapor. I think the answer turns out to be wet steam. And once you get the final state, W expansion is calculated as P delta V and all that, all those details can then come up. Over to you. I have one question. If is there any apparatus, practical apparatus to visualize the triple point? Yes. I am surprised that a question which was asked less than 45 minutes ago is being asked again. I have informed someone that uh, go to uh, Google or YouTube, put in triple point of water apparatus and you will get enough information and enough videos, excellent videos showing how a triple point of water apparatus is created. So, that you can sense the and you can uh, calibrate your thermocouples or thermometers by that. Okay. All that and it is not a very complicated apparatus, all you need is a good uh, uh, vacuum uh, machine, uh, vacuum pump, a good glass blower, uh, excellent quality of glass and uh, clear uh, absolutely pure water. And within a week or so with a few trial and few trials and errors, you will be able to create an apparatus to demonstrate the triple point of water. 
In fact, it is an excellent apparatus to have in a thermodynamics lab or in a physics lab or in a physical chemistry lab. It will be an excellent calibration piece. Over to you. Second thing, sir, that uh, in uh, uh, break, particularly drum and uh, single shoe that uh, you shown yesterday, mm -hmm. one drum and one single shoe. Yes. So, uh, uh, pulley or drum is running with uh, um, some well, uh, RPM, so it will have some kinetic energy, one half I omega square. Mm. And uh, break is absorbing, shoe is absorbing that energy. So that is converted into heat. So here we can consider these two as a two separate system. So can we consider the interface as a rudimenting system? No. See, interface is a boundary. Interface by itself is not a rudimentary system because interface itself is not a system. A system is made up of whatever is enclosed inside the boundaries or interfaces that it encloses. Can we consider shoe as a rudimenting system? Uh, yes, a shoe, shoe, a solid can be considered as a rudimentary system. If you consider that it does not expand contract. Yeah, sir, but uh, the question is there that if we measure the temperature by thermometer, it do not have any wear. But here shoe is wearing continuously. See, the moment you make that complication of shoe is wearing continuously, then you are treating the shoe as an open thermodynamic system because some mass is going out of the shoe. And our idea of a rudimentary system pertains only to closed thermodynamic system. Rudimentary and other aspects are not applicable to open thermodynamic system because open thermodynamic systems are artificially defined systems for the purpose of handling flow into and out of systems. Over to you. 1115 Shivaji University, Kolhapur. Uh, sir, my question is regarding the relation of temperature and pressure. Sir, as you quoted the example of uh, uh, cooker, pressure cooker. So let us take that example, if we cook some food in that pressure cooker at the standard atmospheric pressure and same pressure cooker if we cook that food at some higher altitude. So what will be the difference which, which in which case the food will be cooked uh, fastly? See uh, pressure cookers are used for in cooking they are used for two purposes. First one is if you go, uh, if you are a mountaineer and go up a hill, the pressure will be so low and pressure will be lower than ambient and hence your uh, water will boil at a temperature lower than 100 degrees C and when it boils at a temperature lower than 100 degrees C, your cooking will not be proper. Things may not get cooked at all because you need to reach a certain temperature for proper cooking of some foods. And even if you have reached that temperature, since that temperature is low, the rate of cooking will be very low. You will have to spend a lot of time wasting a lot of fuel. And hence, we use a pressure cooker to increase the pressure of the medium and the food which is being cooked to a higher value than the ambient. Now, in a mountain you can use it for increasing the pressure from say 0 0.7 bar or 0 0.7 atmosphere to 1 atmosphere. But there is no harm in increasing it further and doing the job quicker and in that case you can do it even at sea level or at normal pressure and that is what we do in pressure cookers. Okay. Uh, although the food cooks faster, People who say that the taste of food which is cooked in a pressure cooker and the taste of food which is cooked without uh, pressurizing it is different. But that is I think we are getting into more details because although the cooking reactions uh, uh, speed up as the temperature rises, the other biochemical reactions of biochemical degradation which are also biochemical reactions, they also get speeded up. 
and then perhaps there is an optimal temperature beyond which you should not go for a given quality of food. Over to you. Uh, thanks a lot, sir. Uh, my second question is uh, regarding uh, sublimation state. Uh, as you stated, uh, solid will be directly converted to uh, a liquid. Uh, sorry, vapor. Vapor. Uh, uh, is there any real example for that uh, sublimation states? Yes, you take uh, solid carbon dioxide, the so called dry ice, at atmospheric pressure it is below its triple point. So, solid carbon dioxide simply evaporates into vapor car carbon dioxide and even some uh, solids like camphor uh, or uh, you know those the odode type of uh, solid uh, room or uh, cabinet fresheners you keep them they don't become liquid they simply slowly evaporate into vapor itself 1111 rvs college coimbatore I am getting you, but I am disconnecting you because there is a lot of uh, echoing. The question asked from RVS College Bangalore was that um, RVS College Coimbatore was that uh, are there tables, charts, or some information for subcooled liquid? And the answer is yes. If you go to detailed steam tables, as I showed today morning. The steam tables published by National Institute of Standard Technology, available from download for download from the net. I think if you put, I will try to put the link up on Moodle today late evening. Uh, but if you um, just put NIST steam tables in Google, you will find that link. In this uh, detailed tabulation at every 5 degree C or so of uh, properties of subcooled liquid of ordinary water substance are tabulated. If you want to use a computer program, then uh, there is an international formulation on uh, properties of water and steam. It is a very detailed formulation. Program is not available, but the equations are available. You can use those equations to create your own steam tables. Over and over and out, 1281 SVERI College of Engineering, Pandarpur. Over to you. Hello, sir. I do have two questions. Uh, my first question is, uh, we derive the equations. Uh, just for example, we are having uh, du is equal to mcv dt. For that equation, is it necessary? the process must be quasi-static or in general also it is applicable. See, if you write du equals m c v d t, so long as you are talking of differentials, this is true, but du will be m c v d t plus some other thing. So, the assumptions involved in this is u is a function only of t and it is a differential process. For a differential process, the question of quasi static does not arise. That is, you are considering two small neighboring states. These are the only two conditions under which, these are the two conditions under which this is valid. And since uh, u is a property, delta u will be m integral of c v d t or you can sometimes write this as m some average c v into delta t. These two are also valid under the conditions following u equals 
either u equals f of t or states 1 and 2 are at the same temperature. And since we are talking of a change of state, we do not have to worry about the actual process which links them to links the two states is quasi static or not over Hello. yes so i have uh, 13 years of experience in teaching and multinational software companies so why i'm saying this uh, how, what is the impact of uh, this FPA finite element analysis with respect to transient thermal analysis? So, what is the budding engineers and uh, what are the students, how we give uh, uh, correct and accurate uh, teaching with the students in, re in respect of FPA with resp uh, in relation to transient thermal analysis? Because structural analysis, that, that is different. So, we are dealing with engineering thermodynamics. So, which is going to be deal with transient thermal analysis and steady state thermal analysis, which is a very advanced boost for modern industries, sir. Thermodynamics does not consider any fields. So, uh, in thermodynamics, there is no transient thermal analysis. So, tools like finite difference techniques or finite element techniques are not directly applicable to basic problems in thermodynamics. They are applicable to problems in fluid mechanics, heat transfer and definitely to solid mechanics. So, I do not think I have, uh, I do not think your question is actually relevant in this course. I think it is well beyond 530. So, we stop here today.